Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Every Monday, I bring you a recap of the past seven days of space flight and what a week it's been. Starbase Texas now has two Mechazillas for Starship stacks and catches. There were three Falcon 9 launches, one of which featured a booster loss, a beefy H322S launched from Japan, a launched from more on that later. Stacking operations for Artemis 2 continued. Butch Wilmore and Sunny Williams conducted a microbial survey on the outside of the International Space Station and much, much more. Enjoy. The main thing all eyes are on right now at Starbase is the work being undertaken to get Orbital Launch Pad B operational. Right now, teams are focused on getting Mechazilla up and running. The tower has been stood there for quite some time now, but for the past couple of weeks, the new, shorter chopstick catch and stack arms have been undergoing installation. Last week, with mating of the two arms to the carriage assembly completed, the whole rig was lifted off the mating stand and lifted up to the tower. Over a long and careful operation, the assembly was lowered down onto the stop point of the tower, the carriage was mounted, and the crane was then disconnected, bringing us one huge step closer to having two functioning catch towers at Starbase. SpaceX wasted no time in rigging up the cableway that supplies power to the chopstick and carriage systems, and later on, we saw this black hook thing being installed too. This is the large travelling block that pulls the carriage up and down the tower. In the background of all the Starbase activities, the decommissioned supercarrier USS John F. Kennedy was seen passing close to Starbase as she made her final journey to the port of Brownsville where she'll be scrapped after almost 40 years of service. International Shipbreaking Limited paid one cent for the vessel, just in case you're wondering what the going rate for a defunct supercarrier is these days. Many thanks to NASA Space Flight's Jack Byer for these incredible shots of the ship arriving at the port of Brownsville. And these aren't the only aerial shots he captured last week. He caught some great bird's eye views of Starbase, taken from an aircraft, obviously. And prior to takeoff, he also spotted SpaceX's Boeing 737 transport plane while taxiing. He also captured footage of the production site at Starbase, giving an impressive sense into just how dominant the Star Factory building is. Things are a far cry from the days of tents and out in the open vehicle parts. Over here, we can see the orbital launch mount for Pad B. This is coming extremely close to completion now. It will eventually live out over here at the orbital Pad B launch site. Right now, the chopsticks are hanging over that big trench that's being dug out by excavators. Unlike Pad A, Pad B is going to feature a more traditional flame trench design, something SpaceX have already implemented with their Starship testing pad, moving from the open design of the former suborbital launch mounts to the flame trench pad setup we see today at Massey's. Other than that though, not a lot of stuff to comment on that's not behind the walls of the mega bays and factory. The Starship vehicle itself remains grounded, per orders of the FAA, following the catastrophic breakup of Ship 33 during Flight 7. SpaceX is currently leading the mishap investigation, and there's so far been no public updates to this. Right now, the effect of Flight 7's breakup on Flight 8's schedule is unknown, but the hope is that we'll still see Flight 8 fly very soon, hopefully towards the end of the month if we're lucky. SpaceX's Falcon 9 launches are a staple part of these videos because seldom does a week go by without at least one of these things flying, usually you get two or more of them. And last week we had three. There were two Starlink missions, one on Monday and one on Saturday. Monday's carrying 21 satellites from Cape Canaveral Pad 40, including 13 with direct to cell capabilities, and Saturday's carrying 22 from Vandenberg. Both missions were successful, with both first stage boosters making successful drone ship landings following stage separation. On Thursday, another Falcon 9 launched from Kennedy Launch Complex 39A, carrying the Spainsat NGI to geosynchronous orbit, the first satellite to launch in Spain's NG satellite series, which is a program designed to develop next-gen satellites to meet Spain's government and military secure communication needs, with the second in the series expected to launch in June. The satellite was a beefy one though, so much so that for the first time in a while, SpaceX needed the maximum power of the Falcon 9 first stage meaning that it was stripped of landing legs and grid fins and was purposefully expended following this, its 21st mission. I guess it's kind of funny that we consider this, or at least I consider this, a bit of a sad moment when in reality, this is what every non-SpaceX rocket does on every flight, if we don't count New Shepard, and at least Blue Origin is nearly there with New Glenn as well. Teething problems are always going to be a thing with new tech like this. 
India launched something last week, so here's some not footage of that because they're apparently still copyright striking channels that show their rocket launches. So whatever I guess. On Wednesday, they launched a GSLV Mark II rocket to a geosynchronous transfer orbit. Of course, the name GSLV stands for Geosynchronous Satellite Launch Vehicle. It was carrying the NVS-02 satellite. This satellite was intended to be an Indian developed navigation satellite, but an issue with its oxidizer valves in the propulsion system was made apparent when the spacecraft was unable to perform its orbit raising operations, leaving it stuck in geostationary transfer orbit with a perigee of about 170 kilometers and an apogee of around 36,577 kilometers. All other systems, however, are supposedly working normally. How useful this satellite could end up being though remains to be seen. Yesterday's launch from Japan was a little bit more successful. A Mitsubishi Heavy Industries H3 rocket lifted off from the Tanegashima Space Center, carrying the Michibiki 6 navigation satellite to geosynchronous orbit, where it will bolster the accuracy and reliability of Japan's regional GPS capabilities. Last Thursday, astronauts Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore donned their EVA suits and exited the International Space Station on a spacewalk to swab its exterior and collect some bugs. Not the big kind though, hopefully, but microscopic life forms. The pair took samples from around the life support system vents so that researchers can see how many organisms are lurking there and how far they've travelled. Microbes are all around us, and almost all of them are harmless and are even beneficial, but some aren't, and so it's important that NASA limits any potential harmful life forms, which is why they have been carefully monitoring the microbial community on the station ever since it first started construction in space. The data gathered from this EVA could help research into how these extremophiles survive and reproduce in the perilous space environment, if they do at all. This spacewalk was Sunny's second of 2025, following from one she did earlier in January with Nick Haig. This latest spacewalker set a new record for her. Sunny now has the most cumulative spacewalking time of any female astronaut, surpassing the previous record holder Peggy Whitson. <laughs> Back when I first started Space This Week, I used to do a recap of all the historic space anniversaries of the last seven days. I stopped this after doing the show for one year because by that point I'd covered them all, but I think today's episode might be a good one to revive this segment because last week happened to contain the anniversary dates of all three NASA missions that resulted in loss of human life, and I think it's important to honour their legacy and remind ourselves of the cost of exploration. On the 27th of January 1967, a cabin fire broke out during a pre-launch test of Apollo 1, claiming the lives of Gus Grissom, Ed White and Roger B. Chaffee. The 28th of January 1986 was the day that the Space Shuttle Challenger launched on its final flight. It broke apart 73 seconds after launch, killing all seven crew members. Francis R. Scobie, Michael J. Smith, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Judith Resnick, Gregory Jarvis and Krista McAuliffe. And lastly, on the 1st of February 2003, Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated on re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, claiming the lives of all seven astronauts on board. Rick D. Husband, William C. McCool, Michael P. Anderson, Ilan Ramon, Kalpana Chawla, David M. Brown and Laurel B. Clark. NASA's Day of Remembrance was on the 23rd of January and it's something that they observe every year to honour those who have lost their lives furthering the cause of exploration and discovery. I know this isn't quite as upbeat as the tone I usually aim for in these weekly recaps, but I think this is something that's still important to acknowledge. NASA's successor to the Apollo and Space Shuttle programs is Artemis, and things are moving ahead for the program's first human spaceflight, which will carry four astronauts around the moon aboard Orion. Stacking of the massive SLS rocket continued in the VAB over the course of the week. In High Bay 3, technicians used a crane to lower the left center center SRB booster segment for the rocket onto the left aft center segment atop the mobile launcher. The two side boosters supply over 75% of the total thrust of the SLS at liftoff, and they're really starting to take shape after this latest stacking operation. Laon Aerospace was flying a single staged orbit space plane for the second week in a row last Saturday, though this one was much more capable than the last. Despite not using any cheats, mods or crack and drive, this thing had insane thrust levels, infinite fuel and the ability to take off and land on any planet or moon in the Kerbal system with no problem, using a little exploit that the developers overlooked when implementing the Cal 1000 robotics piece. 
It was a really fun craft to build and fly, and the mission itself was also a really fun one. I visited the surfaces of Eve and Duna, and if you haven't seen it by now, then you should definitely click that card on screen to take you there, or consider the other video if you've not seen that one yet either. Sincere thanks if your name is among those on the right. My Patreon and channel member supporters really make all of this content possible, so thank you so much if you signed up. If you haven't but want to, then click the relevant links below. But that's the end of today's episode of Space this week. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you in the next one.